Cool. We're almost at the end. Thank you for spending what for some of you is going to be maybe the penultimate talk with me. We're going to be talking about automating knowledge work today. Everything that we're doing in front of a computer, especially the stuff that is repetitive. And how can an LLM plus some training data improve the reliability of this work that for many, many companies and hopefully also yours needs to be done at scale in a way that's very, very reliable. Within V7, <clears throat> we've been focusing on the annotation and automating the annotation of training data for the past five years in all kinds of unstructured data workflows. So we've been exposed to several hundreds of different tasks that we humans complete in front of machines. And the trend seems to be that we are slowly speeding up the pace of, of annotation that we're doing. And uh, when you think about what a model does during inference, it's just a very fast form of labeling. And now that AI is, uh, is quite reliable at completing a lot of tasks in a zero-shot fashion, a lot of the attention that AI leadership should be spending time on is on how to start using it and putting it to work to automate things and not necessarily uh, only gather training data for the sake of gathering training data and for R&D purposes. And the R&D component of AI is moving more and more towards companies that are either training foundation models from scratch or continue to train small expert models from scratch. But a trend that's been happening is that a lot of these, these models and these automations are used in the day-to-day -day work that employees are completing. And so how can we capture that knowledge and put it into AI? What do we call it when employees are actually producing ground truth? Every insurance claim filed, every mortgage application reviewed, every SIM reviewed by an investment bank. That's all ground truth. That's all training data. And I think it fundamentally represents the, the core value of a company. So if uh, you know, Yuval Noah Harari says that the GDP of most modern countries today is actually composed of the intelligence and the know-how of people, how do we capture this know-how in ongoing workflows that are repetitive and turn it into an asset? And uh, as a company that is focused on doing this, generally with outsourced humans for, for five years, we've been thinking about this a lot. And I think that uh, a very essential asset of many companies that are producing knowledge work today is something like a database for AGI or database that represents the total knowledge of all the, the humans that are completing tasks within the business, how they're completed, what is considered an exemplary example of that task, what is considered a poor one, and putting it in a piece of infrastructure that AI can learn from. And this single asset will slowly become a more and more important part of most businesses that have anything to do with completion of paperwork, with tasks that we complete in front of our laptops, with knowledge and communication work that goes from one entity to another. And so the first part of this talk is gonna be focusing on how do we actually design for a good knowledge work automation product? Something that we can use to uh, read the, the types of tasks that a person is completing, learn how they should be done, and then complete them in a way that is reliable at large scale. So across many, many repetitions of it. The estimate is that 40% of the work that is being done in front of computers today can actually be automated by a foundation model if it is placed into, this, into the right workflow and potentially tuned a little bit. When you think about it, most of the work that we do is actually email, and I think email can already be automated by and large, at least the majority of the, the time that we spend on it, on pointless emails that are reaching us to try and sell us something. Um, and the, the question that we should ask ourselves at first is how do we start to capture all these low-hanging fruit tasks that are spending, that are consuming a lot of our time and unlock uh, time for our most valuable people to focus on what really matters. So what exactly is missing for us to start automating all this 40% of the boring work that we do today? Why aren't we doing it already? The first thing is format support. We've only just entered an era of multimodality in which one model can process an image as well as it can process an audio file as well as it can process a document. And now there are ops tools that are able to ingest all of these, all of these as one input channel, pass them through a model and have that model look up when instructions is just to complete and then assist us in a particular task. Another thing that LLMs have not been great at doing is making discrete decisions. So rather than saying, hey, I want to Basically, LLMs just predict the next token, and so instead of saying I want to choose A or B, they literally say I want to choose A, and that can be a problem. So things are improving now with JSON output of, of different models, but there's still not a lot of tools that allow you to easily um, 
push models into making discrete decisions. And finally, reliability at scale. We're used to using models in a one-to-one -one interaction like we do in ChatGPT. We review what they tell us, but very few of us, or hopefully uh, some of us, given that we're at a Databricks conference, have used them to process thousands or hundreds of thousands of tasks a day, each one of them with a different input and a desired different output, and then gone to sleep uh, with, a, with a sound mind and, and trust that uh, uh, they're being processed reliably. And then there's other things that we really care about. One is the compounding improvement. If we need to invest in an AI workflow and we need to review the tasks, then we need to make sure that this thing is improving over time. So how can we capture a value in ground truth so that when we start implementing a workflow, after the 1,000th task, we actually have a better, uh, a better starting point for the next batch than we were before. Freedom to build in is, a, is another important one. We strongly believe that given that now we have a natural language interface to a lot of workflow automation tools, employees within businesses should be empowered to pick a model and then start automating small parts of their work without waiting for a machine learning engineer to do that for them. I think this is going to be essential for a knowledge worker to actually be empowered to automate their own work and not wait for some SaaS company to fully understand what they do and model it for them. And then finally, choosing models. This is something that has proven to be less important than we thought, especially because the release pace of new foundation models is incredibly fast. And uh, uh, it's kind of hard to, to, to pick one single provider, but we're gonna do a, a slightly deeper dive into this later. So in terms of format support, we've had to build something that could adopt text, different types of documents and images, different options for discrete choices, and then occasionally at times code. And to gather these building blocks, we had to model them in a way that could represent different types of knowledge work that are completed in front of a screen. And when you think about it, most knowledge work today can actually be modeled by using the same repetitive components. Whether you're reviewing a mortgage application, you are reviewing someone's a picture for a computer vision use case, or you are uh, working on uh, an electronic health record platform and you're reviewing a person's file. Ultimately, like uh, CRMs are built with the same building blocks, most knowledge work automation platform can kind of use the same tools to model a particular task end to end. In terms of discrete decisions, one uh, important design decision that we had to do when designing V7Go, which is the, this product that you're seeing, is the ability to force LLMs into giving one or another option, effectively making a multi-select or a single select property that people could give instructions to in natural language. So rather than just having a prompt, have a prompt push the model to selecting one of multiple options. And this allows you to then create uh, branching workflows where if a decision is, uh, is made for option A, then option A can uh, be selected and then uh, go and ask a human perhaps to assist with a particular, uh, a particular task. Another one is allowing customers to choose a particular model for, uh, for a workflow. This is something that uh, we expected people would be far more opinionated on over time. And uh, there are some uh, companies that have married a particular class of model or a particular vendor, but realistically, the ability to switch between them across different workflows has proven to be quite advantageous. Uh, for example, if we look at a simple um, finance-related workflow of understanding annual reports, they're covered in graphs. And models perform quite differently depending on what graph you present to them. So for example, here we have uh, the calculation of EBITDA. And uh, Gemini does a far better job than other models in this, uh, in this particular example. Omni does uh, second best, and then other models tend to be less good at it. And then similarly here, Gemini can uh, really understand this, uh, this particular histogram that has no labels on it, uh, which is quite impressive. And uh, Omni comes at a close second, Opus third, and then actually GPT-4 Turbo comes third. And uh, again, this is a, a bit of an edge case because it's not going to be that often that uh, AI models need to understand unlabeled graphs. Um, but it's one example of how dynamically choosing a model for a particular task and having a, a workflow tool that lets you do that can help you achieve a little bit more accuracy. And finally, here's another example. In this case, another unlabeled graph with a, a very arbitrarily placed dot. And in this case, Gemini gets it almost correct. I think it's, uh, it's wrong only in, uh, in max set three and four where it estimates 0.97. 
And finally, another important point that a lot of tools that uh, uh, automate work with LLMs uh, aren't doing is reliability at scale. There's a lot of uh, incentives in creating a cool demo that uses an agent and completes one task in front of you. But the really hard stuff happens when you have to complete that task 100,000 times with a somewhat reliable expenditure of tokens. So a lot of agent behaviors can be used because they might just uh, get stuck into one particular loop or one particular task and it becomes really expensive. And then return uh, an answer that is somewhat reliable and can be routed to a human if the model is unsure about this. Some of these ages, okay. So these are some of the examples that we have been taking care of within V7Go, being able to score hundreds of sales conversations or of doctor-patient phone calls or hundreds of thousands of documents that freight companies process. The challenge here is not just one of uh, can the model be accurate on a sample that we're, we're processing through it, but can it be economically sensible to use it across any number of these templates? And at what point do we want to route some of the work to a human reviewer? Moreover, in terms of the, the techniques used to improve their performance, uh, our advice is mostly to start by focusing on prompting. Start with this, and then if you really, really have to, go towards fine tuning. There's a lot that you can do just with the context window of a model. And the context window of is your friend. The best use of your time as, a, as an ML engineer or someone building a workflow is to try and inject as much information into a context window to improve it over time before you touch any uh, form of, uh, of fine tuning workflows. Um, moreover, if you are able to produce certain elements of ground truth, you can do so, and something that we've built is the ability to dynamically inject this information into the system prompt of, uh, of a particular uh, task. So the more tasks are completed, the more the reliability of, uh, of these models grows. In this particular case, I'm making a correction that GPT-4 Omni has made, and now this specific instance or this entity, which is the uh, single unit of a task, is going to be injected into future prompt that have to complete something similar. So a similar task that is classified by the model that'll go and search, hey, is there any similar work that has been completed before? Can I go and review it? And can I inject it into my own, um, into my own prompt? And so within the context window, the things that we have been focusing on are, first of all, the system prompt, uh, things like avoiding preamble, avoiding the model saying the answer is 33, or the total is, and then presenting a US dollar amount. Especially for automation tasks, this is not particularly useful, even though it is useful for the model to eventually get the right answer, because it is predicting next tokens, and it's better for it to say the total is, and then presenting it to you. So it's something that you can cut out. The task prompt is uh, exactly the, the prompt that the user is giving. The inputs are the various files that the, the model can access. Uh, these are target documents or guidelines documents that uh, a model is, for example, trying to automate. And then ground truth samples. So uh, examples that have been given by other users or completed by other users and effectively starred or considered as this is ground truth, this is a reliable human reviewed task. And uh, you can go and query it if you're solving something similar. And then finally, task context. This is a, a trickier one to, to calculate. It's for workflows to decide whether a, a human should be looking at a particular task or not, or it's okay to take a specific risk. And in particular, if you're calculating, for example, the subtotal of an invoice, and then you're passing it on, and you're, you're automating and mar automatically marking it as, as complete, and the invoice is from a new template, from a new vendor, then at that point, you might want a human to go and check it. These are things that have been usually done with classical machine learning models up until now, but the ability for us to write rules in natural language and use smaller LLMs for doing this has proven to be quite effective, especially for changing rule sets. So what are some tasks that we should be automating today using LLMs? And how can we gather and structure data to do so in a way that's as efficient as possible? We launched this uh, product about three months ago. Uh, as some of you may know, V7 is best known for its work in computer vision and in image captioning and video captioning. 
And uh, document processing has been a much smaller part of our business up until later this year, uh, earlier this year. And uh, the areas where it's had the tremendous success have been finance, logistics, and then, as per usual, RLHF and labeling, which has been part of our business for a while. Uh, within finance, we're now able to process things like SIMs, 10K forms, quarterly reports. Uh, in logistics, for those that are uh, unfamiliar, it's one of the most uh, paperwork-intensive industries in the world. A particular company that has a global reach may be processing hundreds of thousands of forms every day. And within these forms, there's handwriting, the languages are unpredictable and usually multiple, and usually the documents are binarized. So they are scanned from paperwork, and then the quality is usually uh, quite bad. So how do we actually build things that can process paperwork like this at scale, this type of knowledge work of transcribing from one document into another? We're going to take a quick look into the logistics industry here. And uh, here's an example of a paperwork form it's anonymized, uh, that needs to be processed in logistics. From a computer vision perspective, one of the challenges here is that usually the proximity of a key and a value is not sequential. So if you're scanning things left or right, it may work in some cases, but not in others. At times they are one on top of the other, and at times they are left or right. There are checkboxes present, so that's another thing that needs to be usually processed in computer vision. If you throw this into a multimodal LLM, you will not get very good answers just yet. And uh, there's line items, which are not visible because there's, a, uh, there's the, the teleprompter below, but there's, there are line items that are uh, of very unpredictable sizes. And this is already hard to solve in computer vision because usually you have to place a table on top of it and extract information from the cells of the table which is inferred usually with a, with a convolution neural network. And then from there, um, you have to uh, parse that with a, well, you have to understand that with an LLM. The ability though for LLMs to understand the output of computer vision models applied to documents um, generally gives a quite a lot of a boost. Um, in fact, if you have a document like this, where the bottom row has a very thin starting point, so a model would probably place a row that cuts through it, and then a description that goes below that, which usually ends up in a different row of a, of a computer vision table, an LLM can still understand that it probably needs to bundle the two together and make this operation afterwards as it processes it. And so in a way, it's compensating for the fallacies of computer vision models, which are faster, more predictable, uh, but also a lot less versatile in these cases. So looking at a simple case studies, if a logistics company needs to process 300,000 documents a day, and there are over 500 variants of these documents, this would have been an impossible task a couple of years ago pre-LLMs. We would have to build computer vision models for every variant to make it as reliable as possible so that humans can be unmarried from this particular process. On top of it, there's handwriting that often needs to be understood, and uh, there's usually multiple languages. Another problem for uh, computer vision models, especially if they're languages that write right to left it's not, and not uh, left to right. This particular set of numbers is a $50 million a year problem already. And there's several of them out there. And this is only one small sliver of the type of knowledge work that I think can be automated today with tools like these. So we're going to do a quick live demo on how these are solved today on V7Go. We've modeled it after a spreadsheet, effectively, this uh, idea of a database for, for knowledge and for knowledge work. And the first thing that can be done is to add uh, an input field, effectively, where we add some documents in. And then we developed a system of properties that's similar to how Notion, for example, creates its databases or simple no-code tools like Airtable which allows people to simply add a prompt and then have a model or an agent extract that information from whatever the input is pointed at. In this case, column number one. Here, I'm asking what parties are involved into the document. I can pick a different model like Gemini Pro if I need a very long context window, and then I can select the input of the document that I had before. As we're developing this enrichment of information, you can start to take the outputs of models in other places and input them back into other uh, prompts. For example, in the parties that we've extracted, 
If a party is part of an account or an account manager, we can notify that account manager and tell them, hey, an invoice from one of your parties has arrived and needs to be reviewed, or maybe we need to net some, some revenue from it. As I was talking before, the ability to classify things in a zero-shot fashion is also quite useful if you can force models to give you discrete answers. In this case, we're, cal we're classifying the documents as bills of lading, invoices, import permits, and the various types of documents that emerge in the logistics industry. And this was done without any need of training data. However, you can perform corrections, and then this, some of this information will be injected back into those prompts. What you'll want to do afterwards is start branching out these, uh, these documents. So if you have a bill of lading, you want to process it in a particular way. If you have an invoice, you want to process it into another. And create a dedicated workflow system for each one. So in this case, we're branching out, and I'm going to skip ahead. I was supposed to do, I was not aware that you couldn't do live demos at the, at the summit. Um, so we're going to go for a recording of this one. And then within each particular document type, we can set our own rules and our own uh, output that needs to be extracted, and then create effectively a customized document extraction system that can be improved over time and that our agents can uh, jump into, make any necessary corrections, and then improve this uh, particular workflow, produce ground truth, and whenever there's a new version of an LLM that they want to use, simply substitute it and have it immediately gain advantages from the very same ground truth that the previous version was working on. So it becomes, a, 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 say, a fine-tuning agnostic system that is able to gain advantages from any future version of a model that is released. In this case, we're making a calculation, and this goes into function calling with the ability to do maths on a particular set of data. This is something we'll skip through. It uh, goes into particular great details. And then finally, what else are we working on to take things one step further? One of the biggest um, hurdles that we're seeing in the adoption of workflow automation tools that use LMs is that more non-technical users want to start leveraging AI and want to use things beyond this chat interface that allows you to solve one task at a time. So ask yourselves, what is the same chat interface that everyone is familiar with could be used to build workflows that work at scale? And this is a, um, a system that we call Ask Go. And unfortunately, it's on the bottom right that you'll see the chat UI, and it's a little bit covered by the, the prompter. But here I'm asking, for every file in this particular uh, database, I want to know the CEO. And then it's going to create a prompt and then point it towards this file, which is a data room uh, for a particular company, and tell me who the CEO of this company is. Then I can ask it to create a list of the leadership team. And this is a cool thing. It's going to create a collection, so a subtable, by extracting information, reading information throughout this data room. And within each table, it's going to uh, extract the title and the person that is in the leadership team. And then finally, I, I asked them to create a list of past investors. So here are the, uh, the, the leadership team of one of the companies. And here we have the past investors of, uh, which company is that? Okay, here we have Square, Sequoia invested in Square. These are all very old pitch decks. So in a few minutes, I was able to create an additional set of extracted information that has been queried from a large quantity of data that relates to a company that is stored uh, in a database here. Now I'm asking it to give me the round that the company is working on. So can agents actually understand how to use a piece of software and then extract discrete uh, values from this? So I'm asking it to tell me what round they're raising, whether it's a seed round, a series A, a series B, and so on. And here, it's extracting information from the data room and the, the pitch deck of each one and telling me which round they're raising. And then finally, categorizing these, uh, these options. Now what I can do is query information that is found within this database and receive more accurate answers. 
in part because we have a model that has extracted all of this information and structured it in a way that is not just nested within a ton of unstructured data, but turned it into a structured database. Uh, this is something that is used in the financial services industries, for example, to, to extract information from SIMs, which usually take about uh, two hours for an agent, a human agent, and then for an AI agent can be extracted with very high levels of accuracy if tuned correctly. That concludes my talk, open to questions, and have a great rest of your summit.